Hollywood, bless its unoriginal heart, continues to churn out reboots and sequels that don't improve on the original properties, clinging to the coattails of past glories, like they've got a fear of the new. Adapted from Pierre Buell's novel, the original five film marathon kicked off in 68 with Charlton Heston and Roddy McDowell under heaps of ape makeup. Doctor, I'd like to kiss you goodbye. All right, but you're so damned ugly. The twist ending, Earth itself was a distant futuristic planet. You blew it up! Oh, damn you! Fast forward through some sequels, each more inventive and slightly bonkers than the last, and you've got yourself a franchise. My people will crouch and conspire and plot and plan for the inevitable day of man's downfall that we shall found our own armies, our own dynasty, and that day is upon you now! Then came Burton's 2001 attempt, a reboot that felt more like a sleepwalk through the original, minus the punch of its twist ending. Okay, let's go explain evolution to the monkeys. It was like watching a magician pull a rabbit out of a hat, only the rabbit's dead, killed by the magician's assistant. However, in 2011, Rise of the Planet of the Apes came along, which we covered last week, followed by Dawn. Like a glimmer of hope in a sea of creative bankruptcy, they're a masterclass in how to breathe new life into a tired franchise. Instead of rehashing the same old story, the films zoom out for the long view, detailing how Earth became a planet of apes, starting from our own era. They demonstrated that you don't need to cling to the past. Sometimes a fresh start, a tight script and a focus on character development is all you need to tell a gripping story. Caesar, if you don't go, it'll be all how war. War has already begun. Apes started war. In Dawn, a decade post-Rise, and the ALZ113 virus has done a number on humanity, with only one in 500 immune lottery winners still kicking. Meanwhile, the apes are thriving, building their own civilization. Our protagonist, Caesar, Brought to life by mocap maestro Andy Serkis is chilling in the Mew Woods, just a swing away from San Francisco. He's got his ape squad, including his son Blue Eyes, trustworthy Maurice and Lieutenant Cobra, played by Toby Kebble, who's got more facial scars than a pirate. Triggering a deer stampede, they begin a hunt, and in a forest frenzy, Blue Eyes chases one but ends up getting attacked by a bear. Caesar dives in, but it's actually Cobra who plays the hero, turning the bear into a shish kebab. Back at their treetop utopia, the apes are living the dream. They've got houses, an ape school run by Maurice, the orangutan version of Aristotle, and a healthcare plan for Cornelia, Caesar's wife, played by Judy Greer, who's busy bringing a new ape into the world. Having a moment with Maurice, Caesar reflects on their journey, reminiscing about the human days and how it had been two years since they'd last seen one. At the same time, Blue Eyes and his pal Ash, son of Rocket, bump into Carver, a human who's as calm as a cat in a bathtub, Panicked, Carver shoots Ash, and the gunshot is like ringing the dinner bell for chaos, drawing both the apes and Carver's human crew, led by Malcolm, in a tense face-off. But luckily for the humans, Caesar spares their life by telling them to go. Go! Go! Amidst the scramble, Malcolm's son Alexander drops his bag, and they all back away slowly. In response, Caesar sends Cobra and a couple of other chimps on a secret mission to tell the humans. Malcolm and his human crew, fresh from their meet and greet with the apes, head back to the ruins of San Francisco. Their leader, Dreyfus, played by the chameleon Gary Oldman, gets the lowdown on the talking apes, a problem that threatens their plan on kickstarting a nearby hydroelectric dam, hoping that it would power their efforts on rebuilding humanity. He could have killed us, he didn't. Maybe he kept us alive so they could follow us and they kill us all. After a discussion with his community, we cut to Caesar, riding into the city on horseback, accompanied by all his apes, with a message for the humans, that apes do not want war, but will fight if they must. His line in the sand, for them to simply leave them alone and stick to the city. As the charismatic and intelligent leader of the ape community, Caesar embodies the complexities of leadership in a turbulent world. He navigates the challenges of maintaining peace while also protecting his tribe. His ability to communicate with apes and humans alike sets him apart, showing his advanced intelligence and empathy, while his past experiences with humans, both good and bad, shape his decisions, often putting him at odds with those who distrust humanity. Unfortunately, on the other side, Dreyfus is stirring the pot. In fact, his first thought is to wipe out the apes to gain access to the dam, but Malcolm, ever the diplomat, convinces Dreyfus to give him three days to talk the apes into letting them access the dam, 
And what if it backfires? What if he gets violent? I mean, how do you know that he'll even understand you? He's more than just a name. Realizing the importance of this venture, his wife Feli, a nurse with more guts than most, wants to tag along, in addition to their son Alex, who decides to join the world's most dangerous family outing. And so, heading back to the woods, Malcolm allows himself to be captured and brought before Cecil. He explains his peaceful intentions and their need to use a dam to prevent bloodshed, as the humans only had two to three weeks of power left, and although Caesar agrees, he demands they hand over their guns. And to Cobra, the ape with a face that's seen more lab experiments than a science textbook. He's essentially not buying what the humans are selling and questions Caesar's newfound fondness for them. Caesar, however, views this as a chance for both species to coexist and bond. It's important to note that Cobra's distrust and aggression towards humanity create a stark contrast to Caesar's approach, ultimately leading to conflict within the ape community, while his tactical intelligence and fierce combat skills make him a formidable opponent. As the humans set up camp in the woods, Carver, still reeling from his previous encounter, but the only one that worked at the dam before the apocalypse joins in, antagonizing Malcolm and Ellie as they reflect on their losses from the virus. It was a virus created by scientists. The chimps didn't really have a say in the matter. Spare me the hippy dippy bullshit. With Caesar and his crew gearing up for another hunt, Koba sneaks off with a couple of bodies to do some reconnaissance in human territory, where they discover the human's armory. Ever the master of disguise, he plays the role of a goofy chimp to prevent two armed men from shooting him, and when they tell him to scram, he leaves, but not before his snarl makes a comeback, foreshadowing trouble. Two, one. Back at the dam, Malcolm, Foster, and Carver are clearing a blockage, managing to blow it out, but getting trapped by the blast in the process. Somehow, in a moment of interspecies diplomacy, Ellie convinces Caesar to help dig the humans out. With Malcolm thanking him for saving them, Caesar's adorable baby son wanders over to the humans. Ellie, Alex, Foster, and Malcolm are smitten, but Carver, not so much. When the little guy gets curious about Carver's hidden gun, he grabs it in full panic mode, and furious that he broke his rule, the leader disarms Carver and gives him a whack for good measure. While Malcolm manages to de-escalate the situation, tossing the gun into the river, Caesar orders him to hit the road. Human, leave now! However, human-ape relations take a turn when Malcolm and Ellie find him tending to a sick wife Cornelia. Ellie, with her medical know-how, offers antibiotics, and in a moment of vulnerability and desperation, Caesar allows him another day to work on the dam in return for helping Cornelia. While the apes also agree to help them in their endeavor, for his hostility and recklessness, Carver is forced to stay in the truck. An architect and one of the primary protagonists, Malcolm represents the voice of reason, compassion, and peace. His diplomatic efforts to build a bridge between humanity and the apes, showcasing his deep understanding and respect for Caesar's community. Do not trust you. I don't blame you, but believe me, we are not all like him. Malcolm's wife and a former nurse at the CDC plays a crucial role in providing medical assistance to both humans and apes, symbolizing the helpful intersection of human and ape worlds. Her willingness to help others, regardless of species, add a layer of humanity and compassion to the story, while their son Alex represents innocence and the potential for change in the younger generation. His interactions with Maurice and the other apes, especially his fascination and empathy, contrast with the prevailing fears and hostilities. As the humans return to the dam to finish what they started, coming back from his city escapade, Cobra knocks Alex over, forcing Maurice to step in. The orangutan and close advisor to Caesar, Maurice, serves as a voice of wisdom and caution. The character is instrumental in maintaining the moral compass of the ape community, and Maurice's ability to empathize and his desire for peaceful coexistence with humans provides a balanced perspective in the ape council. But feeling like Caesar's playing favorites with humanity, Cobra confronts him, leading to a heated moment where Caesar defeats him in battle, but stops short of breaking their cardinal rule of no ape killing another ape. Caesar love humans more than apes. Unfortunately, not one to let things go, Koba returns to the human compound and plays the fool again for the same two men, this time taking their rifle and eliminating them, before finding Carver and exacting revenge in a fit of rage. Here, Koba's actions effectively escalate the tension, setting the stage for a showdown that blurs the lines between man and beast, testing loyalties and challenging the very nature of both species. As night falls, Malcolm and his crew, feeling like electricians of the year, have got the generator humming and music playing. 
Caesar then shows him the city lights flickering back to life, while Cornelia is also on the mend. As Caesar's wife and the queen of the ape community, Cornelia represents the nurturing and compassionate aspects of their society. She's a grounding presence for him, reminding Caesar of the importance of family and community. But just when things are looking up, Kerber sneaks up with a rifle and shoots Caesar, who takes a dramatic tumble from the tree. In an attempt to rile up conflict, he leaves behind the rifle in Carver's cap, implicating him in the attack. Sensing the oncoming danger, Maurice tells Malcolm, Ellie, and Alex to run as the ape community descends into chaos. At the same time, seizing the moment, Kerber spins a tale of human betrayal, blaming them for Caesar's fall before rallying the troops to storm the city. Arise! Kill! Caesar! Burn you see, Cobra is marked by his deep-seated hatred for humans, stemming from his traumatic past in laboratories, with his scars, both physical and psychological, driving his hateful actions. Meanwhile, the humans are having a power party, dancing like they've never seen a light bulb before. In a moment of solitude, Dreyfus checks his iPad, scrolling through memories of his family lost to the virus, reminding us that everyone's got a story. As the leader of the human survivors, he's driven by the desire to ensure the survival of his species. His actions are motivated by a deep fear and distrust of apes, and he represents the human tendency to resort to violence in the face of fear and the unknown. Now they may have got their hands on some of our guns, but that does not make them men! Unfortunately, the mood shifts when Cobra and his army crash the party. Dreyfus orders his men to open fire, and even uses a rocket launcher in the battle, but Cobra and his crew commandeer a tank and break through the gates. By the time that dawn breaks, Cobra's in full dictator mode, taking human prisoners and showing no mercy. He even tries to make the apes punish a rebellious human, but Ash, the ape with a conscience, refuses to play ball, saying it's not what Caesar would have wanted. Not a fan of disobedience, he then makes a tragic example out of him in his shocking balcony scene. <laughs> Meanwhile, Malcolm and his family miraculously find Caesar, who's not ready to check out just yet and take him to his old human home. As they tend to Caesar, Cobra's reign of terror continues in the city, with gun-toting apes and dissenters loyal to Caesar locked in a bus. Witnessing the chaos, Blue Eyes gets a piece of advice from Maurice to be weary of Cobra and protect himself. And with Ellie needing supplies to perform surgery on Caesar, Malcolm decides to venture into the city, dodging apes with machine guns in an amazing sequence. In a bit of serendipitous luck, he bumps into Blue Eyes, who's got his gun aimed but just can't pull the trigger, which enables him to drop the bombshell that his father's still alive. In a mix of anger and relief, he follows Malcolm to Caesar and is ready to attack the family upon seeing his injury, but his father explains it was Cobra all along. Not human, Cobra. Blue Eyes ends up going through a significant character arc. He evolves from a young and impulsive ape to a more understanding and mature individual especially after witnessing the complexities of ape-human interactions and the consequences of conflict. Always think ape better than human. I see how much like them we are. Finding an old camera with footage of his younger self and his late human father, Will Rodman, Caesar gives a brief history lesson, reminiscing about the good man that Will was, much like Malcolm. Meanwhile, with the help of Blue Eyes, Maurice and the other apes stage a great escape from their prison and free the human captives, before rallying to Caesar, sharing Cobra's latest plan to gather the other apes to his cause. They need to get to the tower without being seen. I'm gonna take them through the subway. Let's go. No! The tyrant is enjoying his power atop a tower, while Dreyfus and his crew have reached out to a nearby military force and are prepping to destroy its base with C4. As Caesar and his troop head to confront Cobra, Malcolm stumbles upon Dreyfus and his men. In a last-ditch effort to prevent a war, he raises his rifle and orders him to stop. But Dreyfus, determined to save humanity, hits the big red button, killing himself, his men, and many apes in the explosion. The climax hits as Caesar faces Cobra, who starts shooting wildly. Luckily, Caesar exploits his injury in a fierce battle and sends him hanging on for dear life. Cobra tries to play the ape-not-kill-ape card, but done with his betrayal, Caesar delivers the cold hard truth. You are not ape. And lets him fall. 
Malcolm, realizing the gravity of the situation, warned Caesar of the incoming military that Dreyfus had contacted, but Caesar admits the reality was that Ape started the war, and it was not in humanity's nature to forgive. They share a moment of mutual respect and sadness at how close they'd been at uniting both their people, before Malcolm fades into the cityscape, leaving Caesar to preside over his kingdom. Dawn of the Planet of the Apes is a sequel that ups the ante from its predecessor. It's a blend of thought-provoking themes and summer epic thrills. I was obsessed with Planet of the Apes as a kid. It's like a lifelong obsession. And then when I came in, they actually had a very different version of the story. They had started in the post-apocalyptic world in San Francisco, and it wasn't really Caesar's story. And I said, well, I would make it Caesar's story the way that you did with Rise. Matt Reeves, who turned Let Me In from a Swedish chiller into a Hollywood thriller, and recently gave us his take on Batman was in the director's chair, mixing action and drama like a cinematic cocktail. I thought that Andy Serkis was so amazing in Rise, and I thought that this opportunity to explore this particular idea, which was the one moment in time that could have become Planet of the Humans and the Apes, I thought that that was a really exciting story place. The direction is as confident as a gorilla in a banana store, and he's not rushing through scenes. He lets the story breathe and characters develop, turning what could have been typical blockbuster fluff into a gripping tale with emotional depth. He understands the power of pacing and conflict, with the action hitting you like a freight train, making every burst of violence hit harder and mean more, and sticks clear of any contrivances. There are also these stories where your point of attack comes in where you know the ending of the story. And when that happens, it changes the whole focus of what that story is about, because it no longer becomes about the narrative of what happened. It starts becoming about the narrative of, well, how do we get there? And why does that happen? And that's all about character. And so for me, it's actually not daunting, it's thrilling to know the ending, because then you know that the story becomes all about those little decisions that the characters make and all of the struggles that they're in. And you end up doing what is essentially a spectacle summer tentpole movie that's actually a character drama. Dawn isn't just apes on horses with guns, though let's be honest that's pretty epic. It's a throwback to when sci-fi was intelligent and meaningful. It's loaded with subtext, a commentary on warfare that shows victory isn't always sweet, insights into leadership, the struggles of compromise, and a hefty dose of xenophobia, righteousness, betrayal, and community. Front and center is Caesar, played by Andy Serkis, juggling being a family man and the benevolent king of ape kind. And his betrayal is like watching Michelangelo paint with pixels. It's motion capture turned art. Dawn of the Planet of the Apes asks a central question, and that is, should one species be more important than another? Uh, any kind of absolute belief system is fundamentally flawed because it doesn't take into account that people are different, and we have to embrace that and, and celebrate it. Reeves was clever enough to keep the spotlight on Caesar, an ape with a foot in both worlds, grappling with the dark side of his own tribe as the drums of war start beating. When I first started, I thought, well, why was I so affected by Caesar in the first film? And when I looked at the footage, and then when I worked with Andy in this film, what I realized is that Andy is just a brilliant actor. He's one of the best actors I've ever worked with. He's managed to carve out every single scene is about, about getting to the, right into the center of the drama. Andy Serkis imbues Caesar with a profound depth of character, masterfully portraying the internal struggle between his innate compassion and the harsh realities of leadership. His performance is a nuanced blend of physicality and emotion, bringing a sense of gravitas and complexity to the character, making Caesar not just a believable leader, but a relatable one. What they're doing is, you know, every day, it's amazing to watch. But his commitment is extraordinary. And he brings it every single day, every single take, whether the camera is on him or not. Incredibly generous guy. Then there's Jason Clark, playing an architect with a dream of lighting up San Francisco again, with Clark bringing a grounded, everyman quality to Malcolm, highlighting his role as a peacemaker. He portrays Malcolm as a thoughtful and empathetic character, driven by a sincere desire to bridge the gap between humanity and apes. It manages to put you in, into Caesar's place, and the way Andy plays it makes that a whole lot easier, you know, to let you in and assume him and assume his responsibilities, as well as Malcolm's as well. What would these, what would you do in this situation? How would it go down, you know, and how would you feel? But it's not all rosy. The older apes have a memory like an elephant and haven't forgotten the bad old days with humans, while the humans are eyeing the apes like they're the cause of all their woes. It's a classic tale of cultural animosity, with a dash of hatred and mistrust thrown in for good measure. Gary Oldman, known for his ability to fully embody his characters, portrays Dreyfus with a mix of authority and vulnerability. He reflects the desperation and fear of a leader under immense pressure, showing Dreyfus as a man driven to extreme measures by his determination to save humanity. So I just see myself as a hero. 
and I'm just trying to actually save the world within, within the boundaries of this community that, that we've established. We're trying to rebuild and reconnect with limited resource. Kerry Russell adds a layer of warmth and compassion to the story with Ellie, highlighting a caring nature and role as a nurturing figure in the midst of chaos. Russell's portrayal brings a sense of calm and reason, balancing the tension and conflict in the narrative. I'm seeing it as this story of trying to understand the other side, but everyone's just trying to get by and have the same fundamental rights and protection and safety and whatever for their families. While Cody Smith McPhee imbues Alexander with innocence and curiosity, his portrayal is key in showcasing the potential for understanding and empathy between the two species, becoming a symbol of hope and the possibility of a peaceful future. They have to go on this little adventure and try and help their civilization. But because I'm so young, it's not really a world that I can be left home while they go and do something. So I think little things like that will make it realistic and bring you into it a bit more. On the ape side, Toby Kebble delivers a powerful performance as Cobra, infusing the character with a palpable sense of anger and betrayal. His Cobra is complex, evoking both fear and sympathy, and Kebble's nuanced acting highlights his tragic past and his transformation into a formidable antagonist. Cobra hates humans. I mean, it's, it's warranted. He's been abused. He doesn't know the outside world. He doesn't feel like an ape. And I think Cobra and Caesar have really bonded in finding out what it is to be an ape. So I think he holds that very true to himself. And humans disrupt that. Nick Thurston's portrayal of Blue Eyes adds a layer of emotional complexity to the ape community, capturing the conflict of a young ape torn between loyalty to his father and the growing tensions within the ape society. Rocket is, is a very faithful follower to Caesar, and he would do anything for Caesar. His sign is Rocket, and it's R over his heart, and it means that he will follow forever. He's not the smartest ape in the world, but he's got the biggest heart. Terry Notary imbues Rocket with loyalty and strength, underscoring Rocket's dedication to Caesar and his family, while adding to the film's exploration of the bonds that hold the ape community together. But the really cool thing for me, and the reason I wanted to play Maurice again, is that it followed through on that aspect of his character. He acts with great specificity, and he doesn't do anything gratuitously. Much like the first movie, Karen Conneval's portrayal of Maurice is one of wisdom and patience. She brings a calming presence to the film as an advisor and confidant to Caesar. That's really, to me, what the story is. It's about surviving and taking care of your family and your loved ones and protecting them and how to let other people survive too. When you're just trying to protect your own family, how do you let other people survive too? While Judy Greer gives Cornelia a subtle strength and presence, although her role is not as prominent, her performance adds depth to the ape society and Caesar's personal life. All of the concern with Andy was about realizing Caesar. It was about a performance. And so people have often said, oh, well, is what he does Caesar or is Caesar this other thing that's also, you know, what Weta does? And in terms of the performance part of it, it's all driven by what Andy does. He's just an amazing actor. Thanks to motion capture technology from Weta that's come leaps and bounds since Gollum in The Lord of the Rings, another circus masterpiece, the apes still the show with emotional depth that have put most human actors to shame. In this story, given that he feels as much human as he does apes, and to me, the exploration of this story is this journey of Caesar as the seminal figure in ape history. He's almost like their Moses, and so this will be how he leads them through this next period. In a world where superhero movies are a dime a dozen, and the final showdowns often feel as shallow as a kiddie pool, Dawn offered both a visual feast and characters who actually shed a tear for. Darren, are you okay? <laughs> Well, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we explore Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Cobra, fight for Ape! Fight for Cobra, Cobra, Bula, and Cage.